I'm super, super excited to be here with this amazing group of panelists that we have assembled. Um, just a little bit about the brief that I got from Laura, and we're going to try and do this quickly. On September 15th, Laura asked me if I would be interested in helping to moderate a panel about like the impacts of text image algorithms to our process with clients and our own design um, collaborations. And in that period of time, the changes that have happened in this space have been mind boggling. It's been really, really, really fascinating to chart this journey. And I'm very, very excited to introduce to you all this panel. We've got a big variety of people um, coming to talk with us. And I'm gonna have them introduce themselves briefly because I think that's a little bit better. Dick and Knowles, if you would like to start. Sure, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Dick and Knowles. I'm a director and designer at uh, Dan Brown and Burdock. We are a digital content and uh, design studio. Um, we work predominantly in non-format, kind of large scale, <clears throat> um, projection mapping historically, and, and, and now more and more uh, kind of real-time technology. Phil? Hi, I'm uh, Phil Carlisle. I'm a uh, lecturer at the University of Lincoln, but I also work, uh, work with a company called Generative Machines, where we try and get the creative industry sector to learn machine learning, basically, and set up pipelines for that in their production processes. So I'm really interested in um, tools that people can use for creative content from the machine learning point of view. Excellent. Dorian. Uh, Dorian Thomas, uh, ECD over at Territory Studio. Um, Territory, uh, predominantly known for uh, everything from kind of screen graphics, working with Marvel, Warner Brothers, through to um, kind of experiential tech kind of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, excellent. And Pinar joining us from Boston remotely. If you want to give us an introduction. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, oh, I'm, I'm echo. Uh, my name is Pinar Demirda. I'm a generative AI expert. I'm in this since 2017. Uh, 2020, we, uh, together with my partner, Gary Kepke, we founded Say Hanli. We are the first and only studio to carry generative art into film production. Uh, we do uh, music videos, immersive uh, film, uh, a various different. We implement generative AI in various aspects of filmmaking. Yeah, and you said you're getting. A, are you still getting a little echo on your end? Yes, the echo. Oh, the echo stopped. Okay, Excellent. that's great. Fantastic. Um, so as you can see, we've got we've really assembled a group of different sort of from. Oh, I'm sorry, myself. I just hit my mic too. Um, my name is Shelley Sable, um, and I work primarily on the vendor side um, as a creative director. Um, my background originally was in lighting, and then has moved to video. So that's me. Um, but I guess to start off, the, one of the first things that I wanted to ask all of you is that you know we're here in this moment where, as we've said before. Um, you know, this is now uh, the new hot thing, you know, generative AI. And I'm curious, you know, as things have evolved, what was your experiences starting here with, um, with using this technology in your own practices? Like, have you played with it much before, like when Dolly first came out or, you know, just curious, any of you? Um, <clears throat> it's something that we, we've been testing um, bits and pieces, dabbling in it. I think that we like it, it's not a tool that we've integrated like fully into our pipeline yet, but it's something that we are kind of eagerly watching where it develops. You know, we've all we've all been um, generating images and then having fun with it. I think one of the things we, that we're seeing like initially as well, lots of imp implementation of different kind of plugins and things. We're seeing it used. There's things like Dream Textures and stuff, which is which is awesome. Which is you know, is a way of generating. Uh, you know, kind of these these diffusion systems inside inside engines and things. And I think that that's been our initial kind of excitement has been where we can start to bring it into our process in that way. Yeah, yeah from a from an academic point of view, these kind of things have been around for quite a while. You know, things like generative adversarial networks and those kind of things. Uh, there's so much that it's really hard to keep up with the technology. So one of the problems is actually sort of. How do we get the technology into the hands of people who could actually use it creatively is probably the, the biggest challenge, I think. And obviously, there's an explosion of interest right now because people are starting to see the tools actually become useful for them. And so the question is, 
what would a good tool set be like? Like, what, what could we do with it that is more creative? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the thing that interests me. Yeah. And you said that you've got members of your studio that have been playing around in this for a little while, correct? Yes. Um, it's, it's a bit of a weird one to try because you need to, you need to get the client to buy into the aspect of using AI within whatever pipeline you're mm -hmm. trying to kind of implement into it. Right. Um, so we obviously work um, across the board on, on many kind of design projects. So it's difficult to make that leap from something that's generative immediately to the end right. product. And so you need to bring the client along with that. So. Absolutely. So Pinar, um, like I said before, I went on um, I went on a very large, deep rabbit hole in this entire process, and discovering you and your work actually was a real joy for me in um, in helping to understand where things have come from and where they're going. And I guess I would love if you would give us a brief history of your experience as an artist. Um, utilizing, because you've been playing in these models for a while now, compared to a lot of us. Yes, I, I, I've been um, lucky enough to work with uh, the inventor of Deep Dream, one of the base models uh, alongside with generative adversarial networks and diffusion, was the uh, very reason why we have AI art nowadays. One day I received an email from Google uh, Arts and Culture Lab in 2017 saying that they invented uh, AI art and um, with different words, of course, and then whatever, they can make art, but then they're not an art company, but then it looked like my body of work as an artist. So why don't I come along and do something cool with this? So since 2018, I'm absolutely consumed with this novel way of uh, generative, generating pictures uh, there was a time where this was novelty and it was like a hobby for many, but I always seen it as a, like, it's like the invention of a digital camera. Things are never been the same before. Mm -hmm. So I always saw that potential, but then uh, I think the way I'm placed is different than uh, the other pan panelists here because I live and breathe generative art since five years. So that's my, that's the only thing I do. I educate, um, LA-based producers uh, every week, uh, production companies, uh, advertising agencies about how they, can, how they can use this. I agree. The first reaction of any professional industry towards novelty is reservation. I can understand that. Nobody wants to change the way they work, but there will be no option very soon. Like there's still an option, but uh, in a few years now, there will be no option. And uh, what, what else do I do? I advised recently Netflix, Meta, Samsung in what they should be inventing in generative uh, art uh, to use in their pipelines. Uh, I spend most of my time ident identifying the latest talents. Like somebody that used Dali is a completely different talent than somebody that is very well versed in generative adversarial networks. So it's um, like any other tool, like somebody that plays a flute is a different type of creativity than somebody that plays piano. Yeah, yeah that, makes so a ton, that makes a ton of sense. I'm, Has it been interesting for you to see this explosion? I think the one thing that, you know, I'm assuming that uh, the, the giant changes that have happened in, you know, since the release, um, since the release of Stable Diffusion, you know, with it being open, um, because now all of these apps have sprung up because everybody is building on that backbone. So what seems like a brand new thing to a lot of people is not a brand new thing to somebody like you. And has that been an interesting? That's great. That's right. You know the saying, rising tides lifts all boats. So I'm extremely grateful <laughs> for any attention and um, yeah, any creative uh, genie that is part of uh, this new wave. Yeah. Um, totally. Um, I think one of the things that was mentioned earlier, too, that I want to talk about a little bit is fear, because, um, you know, there are pe people that have said, oh, it's going to take our jobs. And obviously it's cheeky. But um, I think that I think that embracing what this new tool set is going to be is a huge part of how we're going to, as a community, move through all of this. Um, and you know, embracing the tools that we want to have built as well, I think, you know, is another. Have you guys thought at all about ways that you can utilize even future thinking for things that you currently do in your workflow that's even just about doing a show, you know, that has 
real-time render or you know different kinds of content? Is, have there been different kinds of tools that you would love to see developed within this framework? I mean, <clears throat> I think it's kind of interesting. Like, it's hard to know, like, because I'm not a specialist in this at all. I'm I am a designer. And you know we're kind of uh, at the bottom end of all of this stuff, so we're kind of figuring it out, you know, as we go. I think um, there's just uh, you can see the, the potential though already. You know, like I think that you know, even the time since we would start this, bit, like talking about this panel, and now, like you said, there's already things have like changed hugely, and there's like you see these technologies that are coming out where there's integrations into your, your 3D systems where you know, you're cobbling together a few primitive shapes and it knows that it's a boat and it renders you a video and things. And it's like, this is super, this to me is like, this is mind blowing. And it's like, it's, um, it's super early days of this stuff happening. But I think that you can easily see that within not much time now, you're gonna be just putting together a scene with some attributes and saying, this will be metal, this will be stone, this will be glass, whatever, and, and it will generate this stuff for you. And I thought, this is this, feels like, we're not far more away from this being like some this this being real. I mean, I don't know if we are, but it, that's what it feels like to me, as uh, from seeing how quickly it's developed. I just feel like you've had ex you've had experience in building your own. Yeah. So most of what I do is a, is a sort of technology builder. Right? I build things for other people. Um, so I've got a project right now that's kind of going to be doing sometime just after Christmas, where we're doing a voice interface for a VR um, generative system. And the idea is that obviously voice is basically just another form of language, another form of text. So we can feed voice into the generative art systems and produce real-time content, XR content, basically things like voice-activated Niagara particle systems and those kind of things. So basically building tools that take the same kind of approaches into real-time systems like Unreal Engine is kind of my specialty. So I think that the thing that I would like to see people do is actually ask people to make the tools, the, the things that you want to, to do as a creative, like get involved in forming the, the, you know, the products, basically, work with technologists and, and get the things that you actually want to exist, right? Because we can make a lot of amazing things right now. That, that's actually a very, very good point. Um, on that same sort of direction, when you're looking, I guess both you and Pinar have teams you have teams of people that you work with to try and move forward in you know different projects, and I guess how are you how are you training new people that are coming into these teams? Are they very very familiar with the work that you're doing? It's like really sort of thinking about the skill sets that we're we're looking at realizing for the future because you know one of the things that we talked about when we first sat down was that words are a big part of our journey as designers typically in that first idea meeting with that you have with a client you're sitting down and you're explaining with words what you're going to do but it's before you've had a chance to do renders and it's interesting that words are the the catalyst that renders you know all of these crazy interesting dynamic things and I'm curious if you're finding that people in your teams that are gravitating towards this are, are there certain skills that they have you know what kind of people do you have that are using this in your organizations the young kids <laughs> <laughs> um, from our point of view I mean you know territory has got a, an incredible wealth of talent behind its doors and so those early conversations that you have with clients um, to inform the idea or to inform the, the project or the work that you do. Your artists want to get involved into it and they can actually make the stuff as well. I think being able to realize ideas quite quickly is, is beautiful and lovely, but I do think that it's the artists that still predominantly want to make the stuff mm -hmm. um, and make that work as beautiful as they can do. I can see it you know, being used, you know, the integration of it into tools is, is probably the best way to kind of go forward. Textures and you know being able to kind of you know being able to render stuff that has reflection refraction within a heartbeat that usually takes yeah. days on whatever render engine you're using. Um, there, that's the benefit of it, the quick realization of it. But yeah, the artists that we have, I think they you know the physical act of making stuff is why we hire them. So, yeah. um, Pinar, when you work with your teams. Um, is there, like, how many people do you have working at, say, Hanley, and is, are there, is it a lot of people doing the same thing, doing different things? Can you give us a little snapshot into that? Thank you. May I say a few things um, about the fear question first? 
of course. Just, Thank you. Because I think I may have a different contribution. Um, I, as you know very well, I have this blog where I write about the future of humanity and how to overcome fears around AI and novel technologies. I realized in time that the biggest bias in AI is humanity's inferiority complex, meaning we always admire machines. We always admire our neighbor. We always admire the other. But then in the age of AI, where AI will be doing pretty much everything we can do uh, produ production wise, we will have to immediately get over our inferiority victim consciousness. In, if unless we will be constantly placing AI on a pedestal and ourselves as its toys. So, but this is a very large concept that uh, we can talk about in time, but I think it's, um, it's, um, it's an important insight. Um, about our team, yeah, well, uh, for, for a great team, uh, if you wanna make a great team around AI, it all depends what you wanna achieve. Like if you wanna do simple tools or do you wanna reinvent the world, one must first understand how these tools come to life. I call them, it's my own wording, so it's not, it's not a technical name, but I call them Genesis creators, like Ian Goodfellow or uh, Sasha, I forget his surname, the guy who invented diffusion and Alexander Morvinsev. These are like uh, mathematicians that can write Genesis codes that birth computer visions. And uh, Clip also is another uh, model like that, that OpenAI launched. And then um, very smart creative technologists like the founders of Midjourney take these Genesis tools and then make something very aesthetically pleasing out of these abstract met mathematical formulas. So that's another brain, that's another teammate. And then out of that, out of Midjourney invention, let's say, or out of stable diffusions invention, out of the forms invention, then you have really another type of individual that requires to have storytelling qualities, technical and storytelling qualities. Storytelling. But then you have another type of individual, which is an art historian that you consult when writing prompts. So yes, we work with, um, I, I find it very important that all teams, that's my own personal belief, and I wish to foster that in the collective consciousness more, every team that is working working with artificial intelligence, in my opinion, needs to have a wisdom officer in their team in order to make sure that you're never valuing AI more than human creativity, that you're always positioning AI somewhere as the same way you would place an assistant or Photoshop. Yeah, I, I wonder if you have to have diversity in training your model too, like as you're training your models, making sure that they're being fed with the same values that you know you want to implement in you know the the way that you want to do your own work right yeah uh, well some models are way more simpler than others like uh, we made this film for Beko connections where we needed to train 20 different custom GANs and one was uh, mountains the other one was uh, eyes the other one was a uh, leaf um, of course, when it comes to humans, you need diversity, but the rest, you just simply need a similar but different images for it to succeed. Nature. Um, so I guess the flip side of all of this is like, we've talked about how we um, as creators are gonna utilize content, but what's gonna happen when your clients now arrive with these fully beautifully rendered, um, you know, different prompts as you, you know, say. Like what's how do you how are you thinking about how we're going to deal with that because it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think it's um it's something that we've seen. Like I think every time there's a new technology that comes into comes into play, like client client expectation management and education is like a crucial part of it because I think that you know it's the same as it was with you know when when projection mapping was super the rage and it was you know people don't understand. It, I think it's easy on if you're on the inside to look at, to kind of understand the, the limitations of these processes. But I think for most clients, they come at it from a point of view of they see an amazing BTS or behind the scenes, you know, and a, or some tech demos, and it looks incredible. And they don't, I don't think anybody really understands where the where the limits of these technologies are, these processes are. And I think that's something that we we try to do, and I think it's something that's really important is to is to try and educate clients on where whatever process we're talking about is that like what what are the boundaries and what are where, where are the advantages to this process and where are the limitations because i think that helps them make 
better creative decisions and helps you kind of get to a more successful project at the end. I think the danger with the least for under, the concern on my part is that, you know, at the minute, it's very, it's very hard to understand where the boundaries with some of this stuff is. I, you, can, you can kind of, if you experiment with it, you start to see yourself where, where the technology doesn't have it, where it's kind of missing information maybe at the minute and things. But um, it's, again, it's, it's, it's rapidly changing and uh, that's something we need to kind of keep on top of to be able to guide clients successfully through their projects. I was asking why as well. Because notice, like if they come mm. to you with a finished something, you kind of go, well, why have you, why have you done that? What do you need it for? Yeah. There's always, there, it needs to have a purpose, I think. I mean, you know, similar to you, um, my understanding of this, the, the AI generator stuff is quite limited. So I've only used mid-journey. But it's, you're, you're writing prompts and a single image comes up. You can obviously do, and I know that's very broad stroke. <laughs> <of course. laughs> um, but, you know, you can obviously write another prompt and get another part of the story. And so narratively, you can start bolting things together to, to tell the longer form of it. Um, but it's, I think it's understanding why and, and questioning how, how did you reach that point. Yeah, I mean, well, I, think, I think the applications for like, exactly what we were talking about before, because everything is accelerated, everything is so much faster now. All of the projects that we have have really, really limited advance time. It's just becoming the new normal. And so if we can embrace how these tools can help us perhaps you know, move forward or get things done a little bit quicker. You know, that could be super helpful. What I found is that um, you kind of end up with pipelines of stuff. So I, you know, obviously as a technologist, right, I start making Excel spreadsheets that feed prompts in and things, right? And I've got like 13,000 images I've generated just, <laughs> just using an Excel spreadsheet to, to try and figure out what went wrong with certain images. And it's really addictive, right? It's addictive seeing the prompt and what you get out of it, and you're kind of trying to figure out how do I get the model to give me what I want. Clients aren't going to understand any of that stuff, really, unless they try it for themselves, and then they start realizing, yeah, there is a limitation there. I would flip it the other way around and say, how do we make these systems give us what we want? Right? How do we actually flip that whole thing and, and invert it and actually start making systems that do a bit more of a sort of conversation about how we want things to end up. Yeah. You know, you'll see that there's loads of tools now since Stable Diffusion came out for modifying the things that were generated, right? In painting and out painting and all of these kind of things, enhancing the fact that we get some good images but not quite what we want and we want to sort of mask things out and change it. All of these kind of new tools and obviously it's been built in Photoshop and stuff now as well. Yeah. So the point is that we can create new tools based on these models and we can centipede these things. You know, we can make things like upscalers and video producers and all of this kind of stuff. So it's gonna be a big, a big sort of collective of different things, I think. Right. And that's probably the thing to, to sort of start looking at scanning the horizon for what other that's things so I can introduce it to. So um, speaking of building new tools, <laughs> Um, Pinar, I guess, would you like to talk about some of the tools that you have built um, that are going to feed perhaps directly into Unreal Engine and other platforms? Yeah, that's a very important moment for me because our team has been working on this since three months. And I would like to, if he's in this room, I would like to give a huge thanks to JT and XR Studios. They have been helping us a lot in its development. Yeah, today I would like to uh, speak to all of you about two tools that we're developing and we'll be launching uh, first one in, uh, I believe, two weeks and the other one in a month. Uh, first one is, um, uh, it has a funny name, maybe I should say the name later, but the point is to, um, so what we did is that in Unreal Engine, uh, you will uh, download a plugin provided by us and uh, you will push a button and it will open a custom interface to stable diffusion. And you will be able to write real time, whatever you want to see. And there will be another future called segmentation. You will be able to write real time and segment anything that you want to see for it to be uh, uploaded real time in Unreal Engine as two and a half D ready to be filmed. That's exciting. So that's, uh, like uh, it, there are very rare occurrences of uh, real-time and uh, generative models, 
in a production pipeline. So I believe this will be um, one of the firsts. So we're very proud of it. Um, we will, of course, uh, I think the best uses will be something like, of course, take away all the like fear and misunderstanding about virtual production. How does this work? How do I do that? So you'll be like, whatever you want to see, like Snoop Dogg, um, Snoop Dogg taking like a virtual production stage for a day and wanting to make a music video. He'll be like, put me to Alaska. Here you go. Ready to film. Put me to Hawaii. Okay, here it is. Ready to film. Real time. So that's like for us super exciting. And we wish to uh, share it with the uh, virtual production stages uh, starting in two months, two weeks. And the other one is a procedural and generative AI based um, a city de developer, city builder. Uh, it's again like real time. So what will, it's more for content creators for virtual production. It's a futuristic city. And uh, let's say that you have your Batmobile here, here in your Unreal Engine file, and you will be taking the brush and just simply doing this. And you will have a city around that appear immediately. And every single item will be malleable, controllable, changeable, deletable. Uh, it's a great previous tool. I mean, it's like a, it's a cool aesthetic. If you want to use it for your end product, you can also do, use it. But it's great because it will be very lightweight uh, compared to uh, a city like Matrix. And um, yeah, it will look very cool. So, so it's specifically for urban environments. It's specifically about building urban air, you know, when the ability to build something in the background. Um, how detailed is it? Yes, exactly. Uh, quite detailed. It will also, since it is a specially done for virtual production, it also has three stages built, like very detailedly built in the, like a rooftop and then a cafe and then something else. Um, yeah, it will be quite detailed. I can't wait to show it with everybody. I'm very excited to see it. Um, I guess while you're, is there, we, we talked a little bit about, um, for immersive experiences, is that something that you want to talk about at all? Um, generative AI for immersive experiences? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's my, <laughs> I live and breathe this, so just give me the mic and I talk, you know? You know. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been, um, uh, we've been working on how to integrate AI, generative AI in immersive experiences for two years. And we realize it's great for two things. One is a no-brainer, which is saving time and money. And the other one, you get to, as a content creator, you get to play with like uh, these ethereal concepts like visualization of time, visualization of feelings, everything being in unity in one with nature. These are like very uh, high concepts that reside outside of our perceptual realm that we conceive with our eyes. Because generative AI has its nature in a parallel processing, the nature of the creative images are recursive. They are not linear. So uh, we've been doing some experiments. I can show them, like, yeah. a, give a sneak peek. Um, well, let me ask yeah. you, yeah, let me, um, yeah, go ahead. If you want to, I have one other question, though, that I want to ask, because we've got about eight minutes left. And um, I'm, the question that I have is that, um, I guess, I want to talk a little bit about philosophical implications of AI. It's just something that we had talked a little bit about. Um, and it's not about, uh, I mean, th there have been questions about copyright. There have been questions about, you know, about copyright for code even. And, you know, how do you guys feel about any of that? You know, do you have opinions or thoughts about, uh, f or fears? Back um, to fear. Obviously, the legal one's a, a big thing at the moment, isn't it? You, what, what's the name? Ada? who is the artist that was given... Uh, she, did, she, she copyright, she, did she, she actually did copyright some of her mid yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, Right. Um, and then uh, I think just, just coming out from a understanding, you know, the empathy aspect of it as well, mm. um, and the consideration of, you know, if you can, but should you right. type of thing. Um, but yeah. Oh. But I guess and on that same note, um, you know, the other question that I have was like, can AI have intention? You know, like how good are we training models? And you know, can you train them to feel? Yeah, no, not here. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this one. No. You haven't got time for that. One. But but I feel like you have somewhat of a different opinion. Yeah, about you see, that. I, I I think that there's nothing there's nothing to stop us from making a, a computer model that can actually 
be creative in and of itself, and there's people working in the community to try and do that. I think the biggest problem I've got, or the biggest concern I've got, is just that the amount of computational power you need to train these things is so big that it's going to be, you know, gatekept by basically Meta and Google and those kind of guys, and they're not going to give you access to it, which is why I really like the stable diffusion approach, which is basically here's a model, go and do something creative. Like, if we can keep doing those kind of things, I think that there's a lot of future for this. But if we start seeing Meta closing down and, you know, lots of legal attacks on stable diffusion and things like that, I think that's a bit of a concern for me. Do you not think with that, I mean, is, is it not that maybe the, the kind of the, the, the genie's out of the bottle now, though, to a certain degree as well? Like, I think that it's hard to go backwards from here, isn't it? I think, I think the thing that people should realize yeah. is that this is like the tip of an iceberg, yeah. and the iceberg's absolutely massive and coming straight at you. You know, you're, you're the <laughs> Titanic, and this iceberg's already there. Like, if you look at the horizon, right, there's video generation from text. All of these things can be voice controlled. You know, there's natural language processing. There's like literally a hundred different models that are being trained on things like text to movement, you know, like, you know, animations and stuff, storytelling tools that are coming out. The point is, it is coming. Like, you have to sort of adapt your practices to, to adopt it, I think. It's in quite an embryonic state at the moment, isn't it? But that can overtly release iteration, trends, people using it, understanding its limitations, understanding where they want to take it, building new kind of technologies behind it. That's the thing that's going to form it, right? The speed is, yeah. is the thing, though, right? You've got, you've basically got like a hundred thousand like people working on all of these technologies, because there's there's just huge amounts of money in the tech sector being piled into AI right now. You know, there's like you've, if you're from an academic point of view, there's so much stuff you can't keep up with it, and so some of those things will end up as creative tools, mm. and those creative tools will transform the way that we make content, right? Things like, we'll generate 3D content, we'll generate neural, you know, I do neural radiance field research, we'll be generating scenes from that, right? Not rendering old triangles and stuff, so. How far away are we? It's already <laughs> happening. <laughs> but, it's already happening. Yeah. It's already happening. But we talked about fear as well, right? And I think we've got a, a bit of duty of care to say as well that it's still going to be implemented. You're still going to need human interaction. I think you're still going to need... <laughs> It's not going to take over. I mean, in reality, the gatekeepers of being able to put it on in, to, to, are in this room. You know, the ability to, to, to take these renders and then put them out into the world in large-scale production is dealt by everybody here. Yeah. You know? So I think that the, the, there is responsibility involved in it, but you know, wouldn't it be great if it actually made things easier? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, uh, on the <laughs> is it going to make things easier? No, uh, it's just a joke. Um, on that note, just really fast. Um, so, can we keep Penar's mic open just if she wants to comment? Because we have to. I want to show a couple of. Um, we had everybody sort of take a stab at making a couple of. Um, I had them make some examples of different either profile photos or prompts, and um, I just want to share those with you guys. But if so, we have to lose Penar. Can you just switch over to my um, to my screen? Uh, so, because we only have a few minutes left. Um, so, Dorian, do you want to talk a little bit about your... I think it says it all. <laughs> it, art imitating life, imitating art. Um, and yeah. this is Dolly? No, this is uh, Mid Journey. Mid Journey. Um, but I was, you know, I, I couldn't get it to work on my computer because I'm really old. Um, <laughs> and so I asked uh, some of the lads in, in the studio. And that's the great thing, though, is that you do have people that can dip in and out of it and understand how to use it. Well, when he said it to me, I was completely amused at how close some of these are to the act, because there's no training of this room. It was not but sent to this anything. One, which one, where well, are we? This one here, where we've become gods. Uh, we are which is brilliant. <laughs> um, That one up there, where we're on plinths as well, which kind of feels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you sent me more. I didn't show them, but then he said, um, in front of an audience was an addition, and then it changed everything completely. But I don't know. But that's the beauty yeah. of having such a, you know, we've got, yeah. a, like I say, we've got quite a um, few artists. Like, so, you can so, artists. so on that note, um, we've got the, uh, the, the profile <laughs> photograph. <laughs> yeah, you see, so training your, own, training your own images and using yourself as a test subject is probably a bit of a risky thing to do. <laughs> I actually learned a lot by doing this that basically you need really good photographs if you're going to get anything 
half decent. Um, I was doing this so that my students can generate me during a session I'm doing next week. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like I you've had a party and, I, and asked everyone to come dressed yeah, as you. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> so, it? so did you do this with your I own? I don't understand why I came in addressing one of them. That was kind of strange. The clown one's terrible. Yeah, I know. It's uh, the clown one's really, really, really frightening. Where's the dress one? The, the, oh, did I not? Yeah, okay. Oh, you so didn't I've got share, like he heavy metal guitar. He didn't essence. share that one with <laughs> me. He totally didn't share the, the dress one with me. It was supposed to be a royal, like, you know, sort of regal <laughs> gentleman or something. It ended up like me in a dress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, right. We've got... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so as, a, uh, as like I said, I'm a novice, so I didn't do any actual training of this thing. I just uh, I work in my own with prompts to try and... Uh, Get a result, and I, I, to be honest, uh, it's pretty, I'm like it's, it's kind of it's, yeah. it's kind of spookily deep. Like I'm, I think I'm just a template from a game yeah, or something. Yeah. I, my, my eyesight's so bad. They I found you. That, that isn't you. Yeah, yeah, I know. So I, I kind of got to myself quite quickly, I think, and then I was like, well, I, I kind of I kind of did my prompts in in stages to sort of see where it would go. And, and I, then, I couldn't find the text that you actually added. Yeah. Like, so after this, this is when I I said I started wrapping myself in plastic and then uh, putting fish in and things. But it's, it's, um, it's fun, you know, you just, just one, one block at a time and it keeps going. It's, uh, but, yeah. um, and I too am a novice, so I chose um, to use some of these different profile generators. They're frightening, right? Um, but some of the, what, one of the things that I found really fascinating, uh, so the first three are Astria and then the rest of them are profile picture AI. Um, I'm very, very fond of um, Andre the Giant, both in my face <laughs> and on my shirt. And there was no Andre the Giant in any of the prompts, so it must have just been something that's lurking there. But then the other parts that I thought were fascinating was um, I have a niece, and the photograph on the left is like, it's her spitting image. It looks exactly <laughs> like her. And there was no photo of her in the training. And it's just sort of the ability when you're seeing these different things they're taking, um, uh, like how they can, it's, it, I don't know if it's just finding similarities in the way that things work, but um, they're funny and amusing. But can we bring, can we bring Pinar back, please? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I guess I wanna ask if there are any, cause we've got a little bit of time left, um, any questions for anybody at all? Well, first of all, thank you very much. That was uh, fascinating. I could listen to you guys uh, for hours. Quick question. Um, I'd like to cycle back to the legal aspects because I like to be a pessimist about these things. So am I right? Please, if any of you have any insights that at the moment, this is the Wild West. And as soon as a lot of money will be involved one day, I like the Titanic um, analogy, somebody who spends a lot of money usually pays a designer, somebody's gonna get sued at some point, and then we will all learn what the next baseline's gonna be for all people who want to actually invest some money in this. Because I can see, because my father's a lawyer, and I work in this industry, so I can see so many points of attack. The question of novelty standards, at which point, who owns what? Um, some people being forced by court to actually um, release their text prompts to see whether they, um, referred to dead artists or artists who, or, you know, who, where there's still estates owning copyright and these kinds of things. So if any one of you would like to comment on that to enlighten me a little bit, because that's what I keep thinking about. Thank you very much. Go on, Pinar. <laughs> yeah, um, since uh, you're a lawyer, you must have seen uh, two days ago the American Copyright Bureau had a hearing about generative AI and the legal implications. And they have ruled in favor of the creator. So they, they ruled that uh, all decisions need to be based case to case. If ever it involves enough creativity and integrity of the creator, and if they detect no malicious intent of purposely trying to recreate an uh, artist's work or copy an artist's work, it should be fine. I wonder if it's the same if it's copying a likeness of somebody, because you know you'll see prompts of like uh, referring to human beings that are alive, <laughs> and I just I'm just not necessarily as artist, so you know make me in the style of Kim Kardashian or whoever. Um, you know, is that 
I wonder if, that, not that I would ever want that, um, but, but I'm curious if, if actually reproducing the likenesses of celebrity is going to be problematic in that same way. Yeah, I think it enters in malicious intent category. Interesting. I guess the thing is that if you realize that these models are trained on like billions of images and that an individual sort of input image is very unlikely to have any significant impact on the model itself. So the question then becomes, how do you distill how much influence that individual image, if somebody's claiming it's an image, has on the model? That's kind of a gray area. Yeah, I mean, with regards to burden of proof and these kinds of things, that is where I see a real can of worms being opened. Mm. Because, as you just said, there may, a lot of photographers obviously hold the uh, ultimate usage rights to their particular photographs. So a photographer assumes or thinks there's reasonable doubt as to who created a certain picture because it resembles one of those photographs of a celebrity. So it's not generic or it doesn't seem generic. I mean, I'm just saying that's another example where I'm, you know, I'm just... Uh, Wondering, you know, I'm hoping to find out soon so that we can all get more to a, back to the creative side. So the sooner these terrible uh, court rulings will happen, the better, I think, so we can get on with it because this is amazing. Well, the investments that are being made, though, in within this, mm -hmm. you know, sector, it, it's it's astronomical. You know, how much money is being invested? I suspect the stable diffusion guys will be the ones that get the legal sort of battle over first because they are a bit more basically open with it, so they're likely to be the one that's going to get attacked first, but they've just got like 100 million quid investment, so they're probably going to be all right. Thank you all, very interesting. Uh, so we've all heard the phrase, great artists steal. So given the, prolifer the proliferation of these AI tools, do you think it's going to lead, and given that they're all trained on these images that are extant, is it going to lead to more, uh, more homogenous canon of, of art in general in all of our work? Or is it going to lead to greater diversity in our work? I mean, doesn't that depend on the models? I think if you're, you know, depending on your diligence as an artist, you know, it, it takes a while. I think it's going to take a while for people to go through these processes and become artists, you know. And it's about the diligence and the work and, you know, pushing the models to where you're getting unexpected results versus you know the expectations you know I, I, I you can know. actually see it in like communities of art generating so basically if you go on like the disabled diffusion discord you can see that there's like a million people generating Darth Vader on a pony or something <laughs> and there's lots of trash but the point is that there's a few people in the community that really push the model in a very creative way and I think that's probably what you get in any sort of, any new technology that everybody can use, obviously a lot of people will make rubbish, but a few people will make really exceptional works, and that's the way I see it going, I think. Uh, last week I got my first CV where someone described themselves as a prompt designer. <laughs> um, I was wondering if anyone else had received that yet. And what is that going to mean in terms of working hours and the like? <laughs> Can we get to, you know, fully automated luxury communism as soon as possible? <laughs> and, you know, this is one of the things that I think could be really positive about this, actually, is it, it kind of destroys the kind of Protestant illusion of work or having to work hard. That's one of the most positive things I can think can come out of this as a world. I just wanted to... The, the, panel wanted to comment on that. First uh, question, did they get the job? No, they didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> I think did he handed over to me. Should he, use, <laughs> should he use the term prompt wizard instead? Prompt engineer, wizard. prompt yeah. engineer. Prompt gen, prompt ninja, engineer, ninja, right? Ninja. Yeah. Ninja. ninja. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, I, I think it's the same thing though. I do think that, that as people continue down this path, people are gonna rise to the top because they're better at it, and they're better at it, you know, they're better at understanding what language the models like, maybe, you know? That, I guess that's my question, too, is how do you train a model well, you know? That's something that, that it's, my viewpoint of this is very much from, you know, the applications that are out there for people like me, 
you know, I'm curious how, how involved have you been in training models, both you and Pinar? Yeah, I, I've done a lot. I've yeah. done stupid amounts of... So here's the thing, right? There's millions of models out there doing all sorts of weird things, and you can kind of glue them together and do interesting things on top of them. You know, so things like voice models and, you know, voice to, yeah, voice to um, speech, you know, text to speech and speech to text and all of these things that you can kind of shoehorn together and produce interesting content with. And I think that's probably the, the more sort of interesting part of that, right, is that you can train like tiny little models that do some really amazing looking stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, and like I still think going back to this too, it's like, like style GAN is like one thing and like AI is another thing and what those differences are is still very, very opaque to... If you've ever used any of these like text to image models, you've probably seen that people do things like up res them, right? The, the gigapixel and Studio topaz lighting. and all those kind of things. <laughs> the point is that those are just sort of new processes, right? Somebody's trained an, uh, an upscaling model, Stable Diffusion have theirs sort of on the boil now. They're training individual parts that you can use on any image, right? The, those, those techniques will be generally useful for all sorts of products, I think. And that's the thing that I think is important is that we can kind of piece things together and make creative parts out of them. But it, you know they're not gonna. But they're still gonna need to be human beings at the helm of all of this. You probably need a programmer. Just saying. <laughs> you need a creative. Come on. Well, you need. Okay, so you need a creative programmer. <laughs> yeah, it's um. You know, I, I think it's it's definitely we are at the this interesting. I mean, remember when the 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 mobile phone got released and like I mean how many I was walking here today with you know my map showing me which way to go, walking around London. And I literally thought about the fact that, you know, the last time that I was here, there, I didn't have a cell phone. It didn't exist, mm. you know? And I had a map that I opened up. And, and, you know, now this, and I feel like that's where we're at with all of, with, you know, these, this landscape of generative AI applications. You know, in, I don't know if it's five years, I don't know if it's two years, mm. but they're going to be so useful in our everyday life for so many different things that I think it's, going to blow our minds just like how you know having the you know a camera on the go and connectivity and um, you know everything that the cell phone has done to that world just you wait <laughs> go yeah just a quickie um, I'm really interested in the uh, UE4 or UE5 plugin you you're mentioning uh, Will that cost anything? See me as well. And also, when you uh, paint, is it do you paint geo or is it painting on a, a dome? When you paint the, you took, you're giving the the Batmobile example, and you, you said when you paint around, you paint the city around it. Is it painting geo or is it painting on a, a texture? And if it's painting geo, does it paint textures as well? Uh, if I say runtime, will that make sense? Um, I'm just like saying like that when question you needs to be answered by my team. So you're saying when you, pa mm -hmm. you paint around the city, you paint a city around the Batmobile in UE4 or UE5, Unreal Engine, sorry. Yes. Um, is it painting an image or is it painting Painting meaning you just take the brush tool do, does you it will create a brush tool like this, and then everything will sprung. Oh, so it is creating geometry? Yes. From the brush tool? Yes, absolutely. Oh, right. okay. Final full city will sprung out of you waving your brush. So magic just... wand, but a, but a brush, not a magic wand. Don't want to confuse tools. Excellent. You never <laughs> said what the tool is going to be called as well. Could we get the name of it? Oh, yeah, the secret name well, that is I funny. I don't know how that tool needs to be called, but we have a name for the other tool. And uh, I just want to share it with you guys. It will be called Cubric. Cubric. C with a K? E with a Q. B R I C. <laughs> B R H U E B R I C. It's one of these things everybody will misspell. You want to spell it whatever you want to. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the funny name that you that you that you teased earlier. That's what you were saying. Okay. 
<laughs> well, if you have a tool for filmmaking, like you cannot not call it Kubrick, right? Or Stanley or whatnot. Kubrick, ah, uh, Hube, yeah. Ah, mm. uh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> Wait, and, and then do you have an answer for is it going to be free? <laughs> <laughs> I just did. I left. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I want to thank you guys so, so much for joining us and for being um, humorous and amused by this conversation. This has been a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>